Hi guys, um, we're ready to go. So if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat uh, and I'll be able to answer them from there. Um, not really gonna do too much with this. I might um, hop on here and get to just your study guide a little bit, maybe hit some of the things that I didn't really see come up in class. Um, this is gonna be very short. Um, I'm only gonna be here for about 30 minutes or so um, and then we'll move on from there. maybe if this ever opens up. Um, just a reminder again, uh, while this is a review, the test itself is gonna be analysis based. So it's not like, oh, well, there's certain things I can specifically study for. The best advice that I can give you for this um, is simply to make sure, is simply to make sure that you are concentrating on um, what time periods you're looking at as you go through these. Um, they're pretty, the questions themselves are pretty evenly weighted uh, throughout. Go away. Uh, they're pretty evenly weighted throughout your study topics list. So um, it's not like you need to concentrate on one area versus another. It's more so, again, looking for those links, thinking about how some of those big movements relate to the events, the people, uh, the readings that are going to be discussed um, on there. Okay, so again, feel free to ask any questions you got. Um, enlightened absolutism, uh, go back through, reconsider um, who these enlightened absolutists are. Um, look at absolutism in general. Um, how do absolutists try to consolidate power? And then think about, okay, how does the enlightenment influence these enlightened absolutists and what they try to do? Um, see what some of those examples are. Um, when we're thinking about the wars from chapter 18, um, again, don't think battles, think causes and effects. That goes for really any war that we're going to go through. Um, I'm going to cover World War I in like two days. So it's really much more so about the causes and the effects of these wars than it is um, some sort of military history. Okay. Um, chat should be open so you can type your questions into there if all else fails. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'll pull that up on my phone so I kind of have an idea of what's going on, um, just in case you're unable to use the chat feature for some reason. Um, War of Austrian Succession. Uh, again, initially it's about um, Maria Theresa, uh, but it's also about um, the land that's being discussed there, Silesia, uh, and that's going to influence things further. Then it's the act of aggression, not through Silesia, not through Silesia, that leads to the Seven Years' War. Uh, when we're talking about the North American theater, it's George Washington being a moron uh, that leads to the warfare and the fighting over there. Um, but really, how they're impacted, we want to think about uh, the big, really, for the most part, in this course. You want to think of the big five, uh, Great Britain, France, Germany, Prussia, Proto-Germany, uh, Austria slash Habsburg Empire slash Austria-Hungary, uh, and Russia. Those are the five that you want to concentrate on. So as you're looking at these wars, who's coming in, who's not coming in, um, and what are the results for them? Do we see a rise or fall? Uh, France and Austria were two of the big ones in the previous century uh, through the 1700s. 
And that's going to fade as we move through the 1800s. Austria kind of goes by the wayside. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire is destroyed by Napoleon at the Battle of Austerlitz. And so um, what had been this huge empire, the Holy Roman Empire, is now simply just um, the Kingdom of Austria, the Empire of Austria. Um, this section, uh, we're going to start to get into Hungary. Um, we see that with the development of nationalism. We see some of these groups, um, uh, including Hungary, but also as we start to look down towards the Balkans with the Slavic groups that are there, that's going to have an impact on Austria and where Austria goes from here. Um, that's also having an impact. We saw that with Greece already on the Ottomans, um, looking for independence from them. And so really that Balkan region is where we're going to concentrate uh, prior to World War One, That's the region that's often known as the powder keg, and so that's kind of where we're headed. Um, in terms of society for Chapter 18, um, population boom, think Thomas Malthus, think what does that mean for people? What does that mean for agriculture? So as we talk about the agricultural revolution, um, even though it's not a continental thing, um, how is the population boom going to affect the way that agriculture is moving forward? Um, you don't need as many people, thanks to the AgRev, to farm the fields. And so as a result, they got to go somewhere. Where are they going to go? They're going to go into the cities. That's going to supply the manpower that factories are going to need, thanks to the Industrial Revolution. So all of this is kind of tying together, and we want to make sure that we're making those links as we go. Uh, chapter 19, uh, American Revolution. Think, again, connection to the Enlightenment, connection to the French Rev, impact on France, impact on Britain. Uh, where does that leave them? Um, the estate system, the ancien regime, um, all of those things we should have down pretty well by now. Uh, in terms of the documents, you just want to make sure that you've familiarized yourself with those. I gave you that packet for a reason, not necessarily just tied to this exam, but um, we want to make sure that if we're asked to discuss the French Revolution, we can pull specifics from specific documents to show changes in time periods. Mm -hmm. uh, with the French Rev, just as a reminder, um, the it starts out with the liberal phase. Um, this is driven in part by some of the members of the bourgeoisie. Um, not all of them, though. Remember, some of them are actually trying to buy their way into the nobility, and so they don't want to see um, all of those things go away. What they're what they are looking for is a constitutional monarchy. Um, that soon starts to go by the wayside as we enter the more radical phase, and the Jacobin clubs and the Saint Culotte are the ones who are going to kind of take the reins and go from there. Um, the reign of terror is gonna come out of the radical phase as well. Um, the backlash against the reign of terror, eventually people are actually going to, um, you know, start to tire of death and destruction. Imagine that 16,000 people in the streets running red with blood, um, symbolized by the wine running past um, Madame Defarge's wine shop there, um, that's going to have a negative outcome for a lot of people and they start to kind of grow weary of it. And as a result, they look to um, end it. And so that's where we see, okay, let's let cooler heads prevail. We see the directory phase come in. There's still a lot of back and forth between more conservative factions, more uh, Republican factions. And as a result, that's what allows in part Napoleon to eventually assume power. Uh, and become emperor. Um, let's see. Nothing there. Okay. Um, again, but this is really kind of your show. I'm just talking my, my way through some of these. If you'd like me to comment on anything, please let me know in the chat. Um, Napoleon, his domestic policies. Remember, he fashions himself as an Enlightenment guy but he does some things to kind of wind back the clock a little bit. Uh, and this is smart politically. He's not an idiot. He has um, certain conservative members who have backed him in this endeavor. And so as a result, he's going to make sure that he keeps them happy to a degree too. We're not going to see a return to the ancien regime or anything like that. Um, but the bringing back of Catholicism, um, those kinds of things, they're what's where uh, Napoleon's going to come in. Um, we talked about traditional roles of women. That was a piece of it too. Um, and also the impact that he has with the Napoleonic code, um, beyond just, um, it's almost, um, Hammurabi's code-esque where it's like a turning point where it's, the rules are the same for everybody type of deal. 
Um, and in fact, a lot of those rules, again, are going to form the basis for many different places, uh, even into today. Uh, as we go through the Napoleonic Wars, again, he's defeated. He brings death and destruction all across Europe. And so the backlash against that is going to be the Congress of Vienna, um, led by Metternich. Chapter 20, we got into the Industrial Rev. And the reasons for it happening in Britain, uh, examples of it, we talked about the textile industry, especially the, the railroads moving through. Excuse me one minute, take care of this. Would nationalist movements be considered successes or failures during this unit? Um, the nationalism movement in the early 1800s, it's a rising tide that's going to carry Europe through into um, the late 1800s and into World War I. However, the nationalist movements that attempt so far, like the revolutions of 1848, those really don't have long-lasting effects, except that the idea of nationalism is planted there. So in 1871, when Italy is able to finally unite um, in, or excuse me, 1870, in 1871, when Bismarck is using nationalism in the 1860s to um, create war against the Danes and then against the Austrians and then against the French, um, people are more inclined to take a role in that. Um, this isn't. This is obviously into the future now that we're talking. So I, I wouldn't classify them as failures. But you, the if we're painting with a broad brush, the revolutions of 1848 didn't really have many lasting impacts on Europe. It's just that these movements are popping up, and I think you're seeing the popularity of nationalism being used, and that that's a big deal. That's something that matters. Uh, how do the foreign wars play into the French Rev? Um, I think the first one, so if we want to talk war of Austrian succession, the war of Austrian succession is kind of setting up the battle lines, who's on whose side. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, but the American Revolution, uh, twofold, again, the French get into it because they want to harm the British um, as a thanks for all of the fighting that's gone back and forth, all the way back to the time of William the Conqueror and through the Hundred Years' War and so on and so forth. Um, I think really the biggest thing in terms of how it impacts the French Rev is the American Revolution, the amount of money they spend. Um, they're so much of the French Revolution from the monarchy's standpoint is that they have no money, um, that they're still operating on this outdated taxation system with the tie, a T A I L L E, and they're still operating under the assumption that they can finagle money around and move money around to make a difference. And that they can still spend extravagantly. Um, there's actually at one point, um, one of the advisors, uh, Cologne, um, says, we need to keep spending money to give the illusion that everything is okay, knowing full well that we're almost completely broke, but we don't want to alarm the people. So um, I think that the debt is the biggest thing that comes out of the foreign wars, the debt from the American Revolution. Um, it comes out of the foreign wars that affects France, leading us into the French Revolution. Um, and again, obviously, you have the Enlightenment ideas, you have the success of the American Revolution based on these ideas, and you have really, um, I think we think of the American Revolution as this ragtag bunch of colonists who rise up, and really, it's not the farmers who are driving this, it's not the people who are conquering the frontier, the, it's essentially the American bourgeoisie, these are, these are rich guys, it's Washington and his huge Mount Vernon estate, it's Thomas Jefferson and he, his huge Monticello estate, like, these are upper level bourgeoisie guys. Um, these are the ones, these intellectuals, these people who like Ben Franklin would participate in the salons and Ben Franklin owns like 18 different businesses um, that he's reaping the benefits from. These are the people who are running the American Rev. And um, those enlightenment ideas, that, that's not lost on the people of France. That's not lost on the bourgeoisie that say, hey, this can work. 
Um, and again, for the most part, they're not looking to get rid of the king. It's only your most radical elements that are looking to do that at this point. It's just, hey, dude, like, get your house in order. And if you can't, now you called for the estates general. Now we got to figure out how to make this more equitable. And that's what kicks everything off. Um, how do we make this most equitable? How, how do we represent um, everybody who is, you know, a landowner and has some money or something? <laughs> Uh, so continuing with the industrial rev, we have those inventions there. Um, it's more so about how they connect. Again, you want to have those in your back pocket. If you know some of the names, Samuel Crompton, those types of things, James Watt, your heavy hitters, fine. That's good. Um, but it's not, this isn't an identification test. Okay? Um, the spread of it, uh, limits to it, especially on the continent, no why. Um, and then the United States introduction into the United States. That's a big thing because that's, in part what allows the United States to really start becoming a global power um, to a small degree at this point, but it, it's getting there, it's becoming a, a power. And that's something that Europe is aware of. Uh, we have urbanization, uh, factory life. We, we talked about the different reforms that try to be made, both from a governmental perspective and from a business perspective, um, how people are adjusting to this life. Uh, we talked about Robert Owen, we talked about New Lanark, um, the Reform Act, the 1832 Act, the repeal of the Corn Laws, these are all different ways that people tried to um, make reforms based on what, what the conditions were like. The 10 Hours Act is another good one to have in your back pocket too. Uh, that brings us to our current chapter, and this should be the one that should be freshest in your mind. The isms, uh, know the isms, know how they play into one another, and then think of an event. So you're saying, okay, the... Um, Revolution of 1830, the July Revolution in France. Who are the driving elements of this? What are the driving movements of this? How does romanticism play a role? And I didn't really, I still haven't had the opportunity to get a nice little romanticism lesson together. Um, talk some Mary Shelley. We'll talk some Eugene Delacroix, um, some Caspar David uh, Friedrich, um, some of those guys, the, the Delacroix, the painting, Liberty Leading the People, that um, that we've seen a few times here. Uh, that painting has such a cool story behind it. In 1830, as um, the Duke de Orléans, uh, Louis Philippe, comes to power, um, it's looked at as here's this wonderful event that goes on, and the, it's commissioned, and it's about to be brought into the palace, and it's hung there. And then the 1832 revolution hits, and everyone's like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes on all this revolution crap. Um, and so it actually gets given back to Delacroix. Delacroix gives it to his aunt and it chills there. Uh, then the revolution of 1848 happens and boom, it's a republic again. And we have uh, Napoleon III and um, he's uh, this painting comes back into it. And so now, yes, it is at the, I think it's at the Tuileries Palace. So it's just kind of a cool story about the painting itself, but it gives you an indication as to how these movements go and how they play off of real world events. Um, especially as we look to romanticism and see no longer it's just about classical themes and classical content, but it's about contemporary themes. Um, the uh, raft of the Medusa uh, is a great example of this. Uh, Theodore Jericho, I think, is the, the painter. Um, so that's kind of a, a cool thing to, to have there. Um, so again, keep asking questions as we go through. Liberalism, again, conservatism, please. You, you. Now it's about what those words meant to the people during this time period. And liberalism, these are, these are your business owners. These are your people who were raised on Adam Smith, um, who were raised on these concept of laissez-faire economics, keep that government out, um, government out of these things. It, it doesn't belong. The liberalism is really a backlash against not just conservatism, but the absolutism of the previous centuries. <laughs> Uh, the state of France after Napoleon and how France was viewed by the powers at the Congress of Vienna. Um, not, it's, it's not a laughing matter. People are, people are rightfully angry with France. Um, but again, through some pretty sweet maneuvering by Talleyrand, um, he's able to paint Napoleon as the problem, not France as the problem. Um, yeah, we had these revolutions, but everything would have been taken care of. But that Napoleon guy showed up, um, conveniently forgetting about the fact that wars started in like 1792. Um, because of that, though, and because of the influence of Metternich, 
um, they are, France is able to be saying, okay, like we're willing to be conciliatory, but a stable France is good for the stability of Europe. And that's the push of conservatism. Stability within leads to stability between. Stability within a nation leads to stability between two nations or amongst multiple nations. Um, that is uh, really the driving force behind why France isn't completely decimated by all of this. Um, that, and besides the fact you have people like Alexander, you still have a Habsburg emperor um, of Austria. And so to just completely destroy this and destroy this royal line is not something that uh, the rest of Europe is looking to do at that point. Okay? Um, not to mention that Britain has kind of already lined up um, the Duc de Provence as the the next guy, or excuse me, the Comte d'Artois as the next in line, um, the brother of Louis the Sixteenth. Like he, they've he's been there. He's an expat. He's one of those emigres. He's chilling in Britain, and uh, he's kind of worked his way in. And Britain's like, yeah, we got the dude. Like, let's go ahead. Let's do this. Um, so at the the Congress of Vienna. Um, the lines are drawn, I think, back to 1792 lines, so like right before the actual fighting begins. Um, the France has given back uh, some of their areas along the, the Rhine, which are going to become uh, the regions of Alsace and Lorraine, where there are a lot of Frenchmen living there. Um, so that's, that's a piece of this that, that France, get, France actually gets out of it. Um, that they're not completely destroyed and their borders are restored to a decent level. I think it's 1795 or 1792 levels, whatever. Um, but France is not in good shape internally, uh, but from the international perspective, it's not really a bad deal. So, okay, we're going to reinstill the, the Bourbon monarchy and that's going to lead to more stability in France. That's going to be good for all of us. Um, in terms of within France, it's still not awesome. You, you had this thing. Now, people aren't like rioting in the streets that the Comte de Provence is, or excuse me, the Comte d'Artois is uh, next in line and he's going to take over and he's going to be uh, Louis the 18th. They're, they're not super happy about it, but they're not rioting in the streets about it either. Um, it's okay. Like here's this constitution. He's going to honor the constitution. And then he doesn't honor the constitution um, where he goes wrong is uh saying that he's going to do things and then trying to wield absolute power. Uh, we end up with the, this time thing, this thing called the four ordinances. And um, these four ordinances include censorship of the press. And that's something that was so essential to the French revolution that uh, it now becomes a big deal when you once again, try to take that away or limit that. So within France, it's still very unsettled, I guess is the way that I would describe it. Um, socialism, socialism is like the, um, is so far out there is so far left. I guess your left, whatever my left, um, is so far left right now that socialism is the enemy of kind of everyone. Um, nobody really looks at socialism as a possibility or as an ally and the socialism at this point that's, that's out there is still, um, in its infancy. It's not like a hammered out political or economic theory at this point. And so people are still kind of, it's, it's almost like an intellectual exercise. Here's this idea that's out there. Nobody's actually advocating for it necessarily from a political perspective, but people are talking about it. Um, and that's where, when the revolutions of 1848 in Germany are happening, that's why it's the college professors and it's the college students who are a part of this, these more liberal people who are discussing things like socialism. Um, Again, it's the more radical elements of things, but they're at least talking about it. Uh, it's not necessarily something that people are actively trying to put in play. So at this point, up to 1848, um, I don't think socialism is a big deal. It's, uh, I want to say January 1848 that Marx and Engels published the Communist Manifesto. And um, they're in Britain at this time. And I think the stability of Britain is what uh, helps allow that idea to kind of spread. And then it reaches the continent and kind of starts to take off from there. Um, but 
it's it's not something that's uh, swinging a big bat at this point. Um, it's still very, very nascent, very early on. So I'm here for another like five minutes, let's say. Um, so if you need something, make sure you get those questions in, even if it, they're one right after another, um, that would be helpful. Hopefully, again, because it's an analysis-based test, don't spend a ton of time tonight cramming. Um, even just do like some relaxed studying where you're just, you have this giant list in front of you. Um, obviously, kind of make sure you know what these things are, but don't sit there and memorize them. Think about how they link together. Maybe you're drawing some lines in between them to see some of those links. Um, do something where you're, you're playing with these in some way. Um, that can be helpful. Uh, again, we're talking 40 questions, all analysis. Uh, you get one class period to finish it. That's it. Um, you don't have anything more than that. And uh, again, all those sections are weighted uh, somewhat evenly. Um, there are a couple of couple of like doubles or repeats that that go on there. It's just kind of the nature of of the way that these questions are that they're trying to link these things together. <laughs> Oh, that didn't sound good. Seven years of war significantly impact the French Rev. Um, I don't know. I I'm going to be making it up probably, but I'd say not significantly. Uh, the American Revolution is much more important to the French Rev in my mind. Um, yeah, it it again like all of this, it definitely plays a role in that you have the loss of the colonies. Um, but again, France and Britain they have different views on what the North American colonies are. And that's why the uh, Native American tribes uh, and Native North American tribes ally with the French, because the French aren't looking to completely colonize things the way that the British are. The French are looking to establish trading posts. They're looking to use those trading posts uh, to gain money and things like the fur trade, by and large. And so um, they're, the tribes are much more willing to deal with the French at that point than they are with the British. Um, so when that kind of goes away, it's not that they're, oh, I, we can't believe we lost this land. Yeah, they, they're upset about it, and it's a loss of revenue for sure. Um, but it's not like they're angling to try and get it back, and so they're looking for revenge. It's just, um, I don't know, it, the fighting that goes on. Yeah, it, wars cost money, so that's an aspect of it that you could probably look to. Um, War of Western Succession, the Seven Years' War, they cost money. Um, that could be a piece of it. Which revolutions in 1848 succeeded? Why did they succeed? Why did the ones fail, fail? Um, so let's pull this open. Um, your textbook does an okay job. Uh, it's Again, it's a textbook, so it's not going to go too in-depth. But the revolutions of 1848, um, Germany kind of fails because it's one segment of society. And... Um, not everybody's willing to jump into these lib or, um, uh, revolutionary ideas right away. Uh, for Italy, they kind of still don't have the juice um, to get it done necessarily. Um, the, yeah, it's based on nationalism, but um, once the Austrians send an army in uh, and the Italian uprisings, they just kind of peter out at that point. Um, Because the Austrians are still in control there. Um, I wanted to get to the German section. Uh, here we go. So the Frankfurt Assembly that's set up, um, that kind of takes care of many of the aims of 
some of the more well-established businessmen. Um, it's solved not with revolution and complete upheaval, but through some minor concessions that are made, um, acknowledgement of the idea of nationalism, talking about the two plans of big Germany and little Germany. Don't ask me to pronounce them in German or English. Um, so I would say like, it's kind of successful. Again, like we mentioned earlier, um, nationalism is this rising tide during this time period. And so from that perspective, these revolutions bringing that out is a, a good thing. Um, this, the German revolution of 1848 is also based at least in part because the Zollverein is created in what, 1830, I believe. And so this is an economic union. And so now it's saying, okay, well, why can't we apply the economic union to politics? Uh, the liberals look at that and say, this is what we want, right? This is free trade. How doesn't this apply from a political standpoint? Uh, and so there's success on, in that way. Um, France, again, again, France is a mess. Here's our third republic, and don't worry, it'll totally work this time. Uh, did economic shift from mercantile to in the 18th century to laissez-faire all across Europe by the Industrial Revolution? Um, no. Uh, again, Germany, so like until the Zollverein is created, Germany is still super controlling. Uh, it's not until the Zollverein that... Um, we see the breakdown of those trade barriers, but that's only within Germany. They're still gonna be protectionist against outsiders. Um, when we look at Austria, Austria is a great example of this. In Austria, there are kind of two kinds of goods being produced, like cheap goods for your peasants and then really, really expensive goods. Well, if Austria all of a sudden becomes this kind of laissez-faire economics and joins the Zollverein, then you're going to have all of these different goods flooding the Austrian market. And that's going to harm the people in Austria who are making these things because the German stuff is going to be of better quality and it's going to be cheaper to purchase. So um, these nations are still very, very controlling from an, from an international, from a macro perspective. Uh, but I would say that the Industrial Revolution, as it begins to hit continental Europe, does lead to more laissez-faire policies within individual nations. Um, again, Austria is kind of backwards. Hungary is still super backwards. Um, Eastern Europe is really still kind of stuck in that uh, pseudo serfdom phase where serfdom has kind of been eliminated, but really those peasants, their lives aren't, aren't all that better off as a result of it. Um, whereas places like France and the low countries and, and Germany and Britain yeah, you see those more liberal economic policies with it. Um, factional disputes and political clubs that were present during the French Rev. Uh, sure. So you got to kind of think of this in stages. Um, I'd go back and I, if you're really struggling with this, Char, I'd go back to um, the lecture video that I did on this. Um, but if you want to start out, think about the liberal phase is driven by, for the most part, the bourgeoisie. Their aim is to ensure, for the most part, for you know a large segment, that um, the we're leading, we're getting to a constitutional monarchy. Um, that's what the National Assembly is all about. Um, that's what the tennis court oath is all about. We're not leaving here without a constitution. Um, as the king is led back to Paris, we start to see greater division between those who are more conservative in nature and those who are more liberal in nature. And that's where we see the formation of the Jacobin clubs start to begin. So people meeting at the uh, monastery of Saint-Jacques, and Jacobin clubs. And as those Jacobin clubs begin to spread around France, we start to see more liberal elements. And within those, um, we start to see more radical liberal elements beginning to rise up. Um, because these Jacobin clubs are all over the place in Paris, but also um, elsewhere, we see that they're not just driven by the bourgeoisie anymore. And so when the National Convention hits and nobody who the participated in the National Assembly is allowed to be a part of it, it's these people who all of a sudden are interested in politics who start to take over the Jacobins. And these Jacobins, in a lot of cases, are going to be driven by, start to be driven by more radical elements. And this is where we see the sans culotte um, start to rise up, uh, meaning without the silk need breaches. These are not your liberal nobles anymore. 
These are the working class. These are the people who are day-to-day -day merchants. They don't own necessarily tons of business. They're looking to gain rights. It's not just about a constitution anymore. It's about now we need to completely change the society. Um, and so that's why the radical phase kind of comes out of this. It's who is driving the radical phase. Um, that's where we see the argument between um, the Girondins and um, the Girondins kind of take the lead, the mountain and, and the, the Montagnards, the mountain. Um, that's where we see this come out of. And so the more um, conservative elements kind of get pushed out and um, then it's the more radical elements that take control. And then we see, okay, now it's no longer a constitutional monarchy. It's off with the head. And let's declare this new republic, a republic of virtue. Let's get rid of all these vestiges of um, this uh, unequal society. Let's get rid of the religious aspects that kept the clergy in such high positions. Let's get rid of um, titles of nobility. Let's get rid of lands of nobility. Um, all those things go by the wayside. Let's get rid of the months based on Roman ideas. We're French people where this is based on reason. We're going to do this according to the general will and the general will um, and the ideas of the general will need to, we need to purge anyone who is against them in an effort to ensure that the general will uh, presides. And so that's the killing of everybody and um, the reign of terror that goes on. Again, the reign of terror is short. It's only about a year, but um, the pushing aside of these conservative views or traditional views, that's, that's a longer time period. Um, so those are the ones that I would know. Um, and even differentiating between the Girondins and the Montagnards, for the purposes of this, I would say you definitely don't need to know um, the ins and outs of them. But I would say definitely you need to be aware of the Jacobin clubs. You need to be able to describe the influence of the Jacobin clubs. How did the industrial urbanization affect urban social classes? So we see the development of a pseudo middle class. Uh, this middle class is these factory owners. Um, it's um, not necessarily just the nobles in Britain. Uh, we see this, this rise of this new class where they're able to purchase factory. Um, they're able to kind of, and uh, these people are driven by um, capital. They're driven by personal wealth. Um, they're driven by the ideas of capitalism, free market economies. And so for them, it's okay, you know, you don't want to work a 16 hour workday. I guarantee you, I can find somebody else who just moved to the city and is looking for work, who is going to be willing to do it at my stinky factory. Um, so the amount of workers available within the cities is what allow a lot of the wealth from these factories to be accumulated. And as that wealth is accumulated, uh, it leads to more buying power. And we see the concept of luxury goods become something in Britain um, to a degree that it's not just based on social status. It's based on, okay, well, like I'm buying my way into this social club. Uh, and so the great exhibition is, yes, it's, it's nationalistic in nature. It's showing Britain's might in the industrial revolution and sun never sets in the British empire and all this stuff. But, um, there's an element of, um, kind of just sh straight up showiness that goes along with this. And I think that that dovetails nicely with, um, the rise of that particular class in terms of the poor, um, their lives don't get altogether better. They also don't get altogether worse. Um, the areas that they're living in are somewhat slummy in nature. Um, but there's always like the pendulum swinging back the other way. We have uh, the development of reforms eventually that's going to come out of that. Um, we're going to see as the industrial revolution really keeps going here, the development of what are called garden cities. Um, where, oh, we should have some green space amongst all of this smog that rises from our cities. Um, so we do eventually see that pendulum swing back, but um, the lives of the peasantry kind of stay stagnant, whether you're in the city or not. Um, for nobility, um, they're losing privilege. Um, we see that with parliament, they begin to lose their social status. And it's now this new class of business owners that begins to wield political power. Now that they've made money, they can go and serve in parliament um, and be able to 
uh, lobby for their business interests, their familial interests, their community interests. And so I would say the traditional nobility does begin to lose a little bit of luster in Britain as a result of this. Uh, it's not that they lose economically, it's that they lose um, political power. So kind of last call for questions here, and then I got to go. Um, got to make sure, go take care of the kids. All right. Uh, thank you guys very much. If you have any questions, you can shoot an email. Um, I might get to it tonight, might not get to it tomorrow. Um, I'll be in you know, my usual time. So if you want to stop by around 630, doors should be open. You should be able to get in if you have any lingering questions. But again, um, think big ideas. Think, okay, how, how do these things tie together? Um, what are things from, say, chapter 18 that are going to influence things in chapter 20 and 21? Uh, look for uh, connections across time periods. Um, just, I'm going to talk more about multiple choice stuff later, but um, these multiple choice questions, uh, they can really be classified as, um, are they things that come before that influence the events being discussed? Um, are they talking about something that comes afterwards? Um, are they trying to draw a parallel between time periods or are they trying to um, just tie in a, uh, across a different theme? Those are kind of the four main ways that these multiple choice questions are created. Um, and I think that if, if we start to see that more and more, I think it'll be helpful for you guys. So thank you guys very much for stopping by. I hope you have a great night. Uh, please don't stay up too late cramming. The, it's not a test that you can just overpower by sheer force of will. Okay, Get some rest tonight. I'll see you in the morning. Have a good day.